In all of human history, we've never had more ready access to vast, comprehensive, high-quality information about our world. And yet, from fake news to alternative facts, evidence these days often seems to be in the eye of the beholder. Philosopher and writer Lee McIntyre has put considerable thought into this somewhat baffling state of affairs and offers a response in his new book. It's called The Scientific Attitude, Defending Science from Denial, Fraud, and Pseudoscience. Lee McIntyre is a research fellow at the Center for Philosophy and History of Science at Boston University, and he joins us now for more. Good to have you in that chair. Thank you. Thanks for having Thanks me for on. making the trip. We are seeing the results of science denial from the climate continuing to change to the return of measles in North America in an age when scientists, and therefore we know so much, why is this happening? Um, it has historical roots. There's been science denial for as long as there's been science. So you go back to Galileo. I think that the modern precursor was the, uh, what happened with uh, uh, tobacco in the 1950s. The tobacco companies banded together because there was going to be a study uh, published that was going to link uh, cigarette smoking and cancer. They brought in a public relations expert, thought, you know, we need to fight the science. We need to take out, uh, have a public relations team. And then, and that worked so well that it began to be followed by uh, all of the other science denial about evolution, about vaccines, about climate change. And then the internet uh, took over. And once the internet uh, comes in, if you've already got kind of a campaign of misinformation started, sometimes by moneyed interest, sometimes not. But then once social media makes it so easy to, to share false information, we've got built-in cognitive bias. It just gets worse and worse, till now we're actually in a pretty bad spot. So there's nothing new about science being under attack, but I, I wonder, let me make the argument, you tell me what mm -hmm. you think. Um, there'll be people watching us right now who say scientists somehow think they're special, that what they say uh, you know, somehow comes down from Mount Sinai and therefore uh, mm -hmm. requires greater credence than everything else. What's the response to that? Well, uh, they are special. Uh, but what's special about them is the uh, method that they follow, uh, more likely the attitude that they have. Um, even if individual scientists want their own theory to be right or they suffer from cognitive bias or even if they cheat, even if they cut corners, the wonderful thing about science is that their colleagues will catch them out. Their colleagues are open-minded enough to listen to new evidence, but rigorous enough to test it and to make sure that an idea doesn't get by when it's not supposed to. And I think that's really the uh, kind of the, the most interesting thing about science, the thing that does make it special, that does make it different from other ways of knowing. Well, let me put another thing on the table, which is uh, in this era of total skepticism and cynicism yeah. and and questioning people's motives. If we see a study where the scientists have dotted all the I's, crossed all the T's, followed all the proper channels, done the rigorous backup, but the study is funded by, let's say, a large well-known pharmaceutical company right. or a well-known soft drink company, yeah. should we automatically be skeptical of that study? Uh, I think it does raise some skepticism if you see something like that when there's uh, industry-funded research. Remember that the American Tobacco Institute grew out of that original meeting in the 1950s, fight the science, bring in your own experts. Um, scientists do take grant money, uh, sometimes from industry. They're supposed to disclose it uh, in case there's any sort of uh, conflict of interest. So I think it's uh, appropriate that they disclose it and that people understand that, that that can make the results different. But it doesn't in and of itself mean that the study is flawed. Somebody has to really get in and figure out if the, if the study is good. Okay, Lee, let's do a quote from the book here. Sure. If there is one thing that most people think is special about science, it is that it follows a distinctive scientific method. If there's one thing that the majority of philosophers of science agree on, it is the idea that there is no such thing as scientific method. Explain, please. Yeah, now I didn't make this up. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a philosopher yeah. of science mm -hmm. and it's been, uh, so Karl Popper uh, did his work in uh, about 100 years ago in you 1919. Love I love Karl Popper. Yeah. And um, he, uh, as many other philosophers of science, scientists have said, there is no such thing as scientific method. And what I mean by that is not that uh, philosopher, not that scientists are chaotic, not that they don't have any procedures or even methodology that they follow, it's that there's no recipe for science. Kind of the, the classic one that maybe you and I learned in school is you observe, you form a hypothesis, yeah. you make a prediction, you test it, test and then it, you go yeah. back and revise it. Is that not the case anymore? Well, that, that's a, 
it, it, I don't think it ever was the case. Huh. I, I think that's a uh, that's a kind of a rational reconstruction. That's a that's a logical reconstruction that people do after the fact. But if you look at how scientists actually do their work, uh, it, it is a, a little bit messier than that. But my point in the book is no less rigorous because. Uh, the argument that I make in the book is that the thing that separates science from non-science is not some special methodology that just anybody can follow. It's the attitude. And the scientific attitude, I think, is the idea that scientists are uh, open to new evidence, uh, that they care about evidence, and they're open to new evidence which can change their mind. As long as you go in with that, it doesn't matter whether you ob observe first, you have your hypothesis first, uh, multiple testing, you know, however you need to get there. If you have the right attitude, you're going to, uh, then that works. Having said that, you, I think you do say in the book that we need to focus on science's failures as opposed to yes. its successes. How come? Well, it, it's, it, it, it sounds counterintuitive to do that. And if you look at the history of science, and you look at philosophers of science and the examples that they come up with, they're enamored with the transition from Newton to Einstein, with the Copernican Revolution, with Darwin. You know, the, these are all really important moments in the history of science. My working hypothesis in the book is that you really learn the most about what science is by looking at uh, fields that are trying to become scientific but haven't. Because if, if you think about it, so what are the distinguishing characteristics of science? Um, you learn about what those characteristics are by looking at the failures, by looking at the fields in the social sciences or the pseudosciences, which are really not living up to the standard. You can learn a lot from physics about what's special about science, but it's not the whole story. I, I think as I say in the book, it's, it's kind of like uh, drawing targets around where the, uh, where the arrows hit, uh, where the darts hit. Hmm. It's just, it's, it's not quite the whole story. Here's an expression from your book. We'll need some further clarification on sure. this. The problem of demarcation, what is that? Okay, so that really goes back to, uh, to Popper. The problem of demarcation is this idea that there has to be this um, logical way, uh, ideally, to separate out science from non-science. So that what they were really looking for in the, in the parlance that philosophers use, the necessary and sufficient conditions for science. And I'm gonna tell you, they've been looking for this for 100 years, mm -hmm. they haven't found it, and they're not going to find it. And it's because every time you uh, come uh, you come up with something like this, you're, you're gonna make mistakes. You're either gonna include something that you don't wanna include as scientific, or you're gonna exclude something that you didn't want to. Uh, Popper's a great example. He, by his original criteria of demarcation, he thought that Darwinian biology was not scientific. Now, he took it back very quickly, but that just goes to show you, uh, when you try to shoehorn what's special about science into some logical uh, criteria of demarcation, it doesn't work. And I, I kind of, uh, commit a little bit of heresy in my book because I'm making the claim that what's really distinctive about science are scientific values, not uh, the objectivity, not the, the uh, scientific facts, but the, uh, and not the methodology, but the idea that scientists have this creed that they live by where they really care uh, about evidence and change their mind based on new evidence. I think that if you do that, you're a scientist. You might be spitting a bit into the wind with that yeah. philosophy, I know. right? Yeah, I know. I'm not sure you'd get a seconding vote from a lot of scientists <laughs> on that one. This is why I talk about fraud, and this is why in the book I also talk about uh, something short of fraud, which are just mistakes that people make because they're overzealous. One thing I talk about in the book is uh, something that happened in the late 1980s, uh, a cold fusion. I don't know if you, you remember this. Yeah, but sure. The, they, they did it once and they couldn't do it again. They, and they couldn't do it again, right? And there, I, I don't think that they were committing fraud. I don't think that they thought that they were doing anything wrong. They were just overzealous because, you know, imagine uh, the Nobel Prize that they would get if this had worked you, because you could get free energy from, from seawater, you know, basically mm. was what it came down to. And so, you know, things like that happen in science. And what we really require is that the community comes in and does the correction. Uh, one misconception that some people have uh, had when I talk about the scientific attitude is that it's not to say that every single scientist has to uh, embody it, though that's ideal. Mm -hmm. But the point is that science as a whole, science as a community, uh, can correct the individual. Sometimes people don't change their minds. Sometimes scientists are, are wrong and they'll continue to be wrong and they sort of get read out of the profession. That's okay too, we learn from that.
that's instance of failure that we learn from. You do have a quote from Ted Cruz in the book, the U.S. I senator do. from I Texas, who's a very bright guy. He and is. We're, we're, we're going um, to read the quote here, and okay. then uh, I'll get you to respond to it. Any good scientist questions all science. If you show me a scientist that stops questioning science, I'll show you someone who isn't a scientist. Look in the world of global warming. What is the language they use? They call anyone who questions the science a denier. Denier is not the language of science. Denier is the language of religion. You want to respond to that? Yeah. Ted Cruz went on in that quotation, he said other places, that uh, we're waiting for the, uh, for the next Galileo. Uh, you know, we're waiting for that crank who, you know, it was a one in a million shot that he was right and he turns out to be right. Mm. Um, the problem is that uh, what he's doing there is exploiting uncertainty. Um, science really has uh, built in uncertainty. That's just the way that, uh, that science works with uh, inductive reasoning. There, there's, there are going to be uh, uh, things that we don't know. Uh, science can't prove anything. Uh, it, it can't come to a certain conclusion. What happens is uh, what Ted Cruz is doing. It's it's a kind of faux skepticism. Well, he's, he's sort of associating himself with science by saying, "Look, I'm 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 like you, but prove it to me." That that's yeah. that's common though. I mean, he's saying I'm more scientific than the scientists. Right. The scientists are not really uh, good. Uh, but notice what he's doing there. He's saying that if there's any degree of uncertainty in science, then his theory is just as likely to be true. That's something that you find in flat Earth. That's something that you find about evolution anti-vax, they, they exploit this idea that until the day comes when all the evidence is in, when it's settled science and there's no more question about it, that it's, it's possible that they're right, therefore it's likely that they're right. But it's not. Um, they've just, uh, Reuters just reported that there's a one in a million chance that the uh, science, uh, that, that the climate change deniers are right. Um, is that really something that Cruz is comfortable with? I mean. I, I, I don't think so. And his parents are scientists. He should know better. Well, let me, let me ask the follow-up, which is, he, he's a brilliant guy. Yeah. Do you find it particularly egregious when guys who are brilliant, he went to, you know, he's, yeah. he's, a, he's a big brain, this guy. Yeah. Do you find it particularly egregious when somebody like that kind of twists the argument to his ends? Well, I'm, there's a point at which I'm not sure they're twisting anymore. There's a point at which I think that they actually believe it. So there's such a thing as spin doctoring or what they call in Washington, uh, D.C., paying the crazy tax, right? You say certain things to get elected because you have to say them. But then there comes a point where I think that after you say the same thing over and over again, uh, maybe you begin to believe it. And I, and I really don't know anymore uh, with Ted Cruz and, and with folks uh, like him whether they actually believe it or whether they're just saying what they think they need to say uh, to get elected. That's why it's so important to fight back against science denial. It, you, you never really maybe will convince the science denier that he or she's wrong, but every lie has an audience. When uh, I went to the Flat Earth Convention in November and I, uh, there were 600 Flat Earthers there, and I pushed back because I'm never gonna maybe convince the person that I'm talking to, but all the people who are listening they might end up uh, being convinced or at least have a little bit of skepticism about what they're hearing from, uh, from the flat earth person. But that's the thing. Science has skepticism attached to it. It does. So that line about, well, look, we're, we're skeptical yep. about the earth being round. That's right. It has a patina of truth in there, doesn't it? Uh, it or truthiness, yeah. maybe we should say. <laughs> yeah. So what, so what they're doing, again, is they're exploiting the, the uncertainty. Mm -hmm. Um, I, the distinction that I draw, the, the one that I drew in the book and, and the, uh, the one that I really uh, think is true, is that scientists are true skeptics because a true skeptic is not just somebody who's reflexively against something until all the data are in. A true skeptic is somebody who withholds judgment until enough data are in that it's sufficient warrant, it's sufficient justification to have rational belief. Um, that kind of skepticism that what you just read that's sort of cafeteria skepticism. You know, that's skepticism about the things that you don't want to believe. But then notice that Ted Cruz is also completely gullible about the thing that he does want to believe, which is that 19, uh, uh, what, what was the year even though? Was it uh, 1989? I, I don't even remember anymore. When El Nino happened. Oh, right? yes, okay. So, so this was the year that we should be comparing it to. Well, he's just cherry picked out that one year to say that, you know, that's the most important year in, uh, you know, in the history of the climate. Because if you pick out that year as your baseline, then it shows that there hasn't been an increase in global temperature in the, you know, the following 17 years. But that's, that's a double standard. That's not actual skepticism. All right. Let's try to separate 
some of the reality from the junk science or the pseudoscience, yep. as you like to call it. Yep. Um, and let's focus on healthcare. There, there are people who have gone to uh, homeopaths, for example. There are people who have experienced crystal healing, um, faith healing, and mm -hmm. they will say, this worked for me, therefore it is scientifically valid, therefore we should all believe it. You're pushing back on that? Uh, I do. Uh, that, that is scientists push back uh, against that. Uh, they need double-blind controlled experiments uh, to, to prove something like that, where you uh, look at the placebo effect. So this uh, homeopathy is a, a good example. So you need to have experiments where um, the person who's uh, you know, undergoing the treatment uh, maybe doesn't know that you, what they're getting, and so, you, so you're able to measure the placebo effect. But the point with science is, when the hypothesis is dead, it's dead. When it can't be proven, when it's been debunked, when there's a problem with their methodology, when there's, they've run the crucial experiment and it failed, then it's over. If it works, who cares? I guess that's the question. Well, if, if it's not harming anyone. Yeah. Uh, but you've got to remember, too, that uh, it, it depends. Uh, I mean, so why not just use a placebo, right? Why, why do acupuncture when you could just use a... a you know, uh, fake acupuncture. Mm. So truth that, at the end of the day still matters. I, I, think, it, I think it does, mm. yeah. Okay, there are many things science does not understand, obviously. Yep. Um, for example, no one knows what happens to us after we die. Is it fair for us to decide what we want to believe in when it comes to the unknowable? You, you've asked a terrific question that I've, it's bedeviled me. It's, it's really kind of one that got me into to philosophy, if you, if you uh, want to tell the truth. Um, I don't think we know what happens to us after we die. And if you, and that's one of the unknowns. I don't think that science can tell us. I don't think that anybody can tell us because there are no data. So that's something where I think true agnosticism is absolutely warranted. But you read Dawkins, the, the famous atheist, and he'll say, oh, well, if there's, no, if there's no God, which he thinks he can show that there isn't, then there wouldn't be an afterlife. Um, I, I think that's nonsense. Um, my my uh, argument, I've never met him, but if I ever meet him, what I want to say is, um, if you don't think that you need a God to explain this world, why would you need a God to explain the next one? It, it could be that something wonderful happens to us or nothing. We, don't, we have no idea what happens to us after we die. Uh, no data whatsoever. So there are some truths that are beyond science, but if it's an empirical matter, if it's a truth about our world where there are sensory data, there's nothing better than science. He's been on this show a few times, and I guess it's true okay. that, that it, it, neither side can empirically prove their side in this debate. Right? Uh, th uh, that's correct. So yeah. what can you do? Uh, <laughs> say nothing. Take be, your best be, shot. Be yeah. agnostic. Well, as we consider changing the hearts of minds of those who don't necessarily believe, is it possible, in your view, to change the minds of those who would deny science its appropriate place? Yes. I, I, I think... How do you do it? Okay, so it's very hard because you don't convince somebody who doesn't believe in evidence by sharing more evidence. No, that just makes them dig in harder. Right, and, and you also don't convince them by calling their names or getting angry. Um, we've sort of inhabit our different silos now, and in some ways we're not talking to one another. The way that you change somebody's mind is to build trust, to have one-on-one -on -one conversations, to, uh, to engage, to, to hear the other side. Uh, I think that's very important. If you look at the anti-vax crisis, what's going on right now in uh, Clark County, Washington, in, in Washington State, uh, the governor of the state has sent out public health officials to meet with people, to talk at workshops, sometimes one-on-one, -on -one, and they are changing minds. There are people, I, I remember reading one of the media reports where a woman said that um, this was the first time, she, she had decided to vaccinate her child, and she said that this was the first time that anybody had ever listened to her and taken her doubt seriously. But the scientist that she was talking to spent two hours with her, uh, took all of her questions, explained things patiently, and she changed her mind. Hmm. Hard to do. But I think that if really, and I've had some pushback from scientists who say, look, we're busy in our labs. We don't have time to do this. Yeah. But the thing that I want to ask is, what's our alternative? I mean, how much worse is science denial going to get? The internet's not going away. Mm. Uh, cognitive bias isn't going away. Uh, I can't believe that anti-vax has gone as far as it is. I can't believe that flat earth uh, is is where it is. I just I think this is going to continue to get worse. And science denial. Just look at the example of climate change. Uh, that that's really frightening. It's really the maybe the fate of humanity is at stake. Uh, in very short order, we have to get people to start to listen to this. So I think it's very important that we learn 
how to talk to people who don't agree with us. And the backfire effect is a real thing, right? If you, it, if it you is push absolutely. your case harder, people are just going to dig in harder. Yeah, it, it, not, not reflexively. That It was a little bit more uh, uh, subtle finding than that. Mm -hmm. But it did, uh, but there's also some other uh, evidence. There are some studies uh, that I cite in one of my earlier books, uh, Post-Truth, by uh, James Kuklinski, and there's one by David Redlosk, who were social psychologists who talk about the fact that what one thing that convinces people is evidence. It's just the context of the evidence. Mm. You don't just shove the evidence down their throat and yell at them. You, the uh, context matters, but you can actually change people's mind. Uh, one of my one of my favorite stories was the uh, uh, the mayor of Coral Gables, Florida, who was a rock rib Republican, and four days into his mayorship, changed his mind about climate change. And it was because all the business owners were coming to him and complaining uh, about the water level rise. And the and the the funny part of it was that um, Coral Gables, a very rich community, uh, people couldn't get their yachts out. Uh, <laughs> their, the mast of their yachts was. Uh, hitting the uh, the bridge because the water level had gone up. Had gone now, up. So that's when it becomes real, right? So you can actually change people's mind when you get their attention. And that's one thing that I'm hoping that this book does is give scientists and others who care about science the wherewithal to know what to say when you're talking with science deniers to try to change their mind. That story reflects another scientific reality, which is all politics is local. Yeah. And we know who said that, Tip O'Neill, another yeah. great New Englander like That's you. That's right. <laughs> uh, the name of the book is The Scientific Attitude, Defending Science from Denial, Fraud, and Pseudoscience. It's by Lee McIntyre, Research Fellow at the Center for Philosophy and History of Science at Boston University, 10 minutes from Fenway Park, the most beautiful place on Earth. <laughs> Lee, it's good of you to come into TVO tonight. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.